It's okay to debt it. I'll say it again. <laughs> it's okay to debt it. Back in uh, 1938, uh, a gentleman who was a well-known director and writer and uh, uh, radio, radio personality, uh, the name of Orson Welles, and a few of his compatriots put together a, a little radio show based on H.G. Wells, spelled differently, uh, book, The War of the Worlds. And he'd written the book back in 1898. Well, they, they'd adapted it a little bit, and uh, it was a story about uh, aliens coming into uh, invading America, landing in New Jersey, if you will. And they made it like a, uh, uh, kind of like a newscast. And so, so they were presenting it kind of like a newscast, and Orson Welles had this kind of deep, kind of manly voice, kind of like my voice. <laughs> <laughs> the radio personality stuff. And uh, people would tune in from other radio stations, and they would hear this, this story about the aliens who were invading New Jersey. And uh, a lot of people believed it. it, was, it he, they, they made no bones about it, it was a fiction. And so it, 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 how many heard the story? Most of you, okay. So. <laughs> So, but, but a lot of people bought into it, and there was kind of a panic that ensued, and they were really upset when they found out that it wasn't true. You'd think they would be more upset that they found out that it wasn't true, but no. <laughs> and to be fair, it was 1938, it was about a year before the war broke out, there were murmurs of wars and invasions and things happening in, in, uh, in Europe, and so people were kind of on the edge, <laughs> so, and so they kind of bought into that. They should, should they have? No, they shouldn't have. They should have thought about it a little bit first. <laughs> And not necessarily believed it just because they, they heard that aliens had invaded New Jersey. Uh, I got a, a forward this week. I don't know how many of you email. Most, most people now, the, the, the numbers have gone up. And, uh, you know, <laughs> emails come pouring into your inbox and your, your email thing. And uh, they, they keep flowing, flowing through. I got one this week. And a forward, so a forward for those of you that are not computer savvy at all. It's just somebody writes something, maybe a little, a little joke or... Uh, a, little, a poem or a, a, a bunch of pictures that are, are, are of interest or a, a link to a website that's of interest and they'll, they'll send it to everybody in their, on their mailing list, on their email list. And everybody gets the forward. And so uh, this forward came my way and it had some beautiful pictures of uh, uh, icebergs floating around in the water. Beautiful icebergs. And they, 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 they kind of cleaved off of a glacier, I guess, and they, and, uh, they were floating around. There There's actual pictures of people in a kind of a raft taking pictures of them, and, and the writing all along beside the pictures was that the, these, these uh, icebergs were floating around in Lake Winnipeg. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I kind of, that just doesn't seem right, you know, because I thought, you know, hey, I've never heard of such a thing before. There are no, <laughs> you know, Winnipeg's not that far north, really. Uh, there are no glaciers around the shores of Lake Winnipeg. Um, I don't think that's really true. And sure enough, I investigated a little bit further, and they were glaciers, they, they, they were icebergs that have, I don't know what the word is, cleaved off, or uh, the glacier, glacier in Antarctica. <laughs> and it was from about 2002, it wasn't like this spring. So, you know, you've got to watch what you read and what, what, what you're hearing. April 1st. Uh, what's that? It was April 1st. Was it April 1st? <laughs> I got it on, no, I don't think it was, but anyway, yeah. maybe it was. On April 1st? Well, yeah, the next day. The uh, next day, maybe that's what it was all So there are people, but on, kind of on the other, the other side of the coin, on the other hand, there are people who don't believe in the Holocaust. They don't think that happened. They don't think six million Jews died in the, the Holocaust in the Second World War. And other people don't believe in the moonwalk. They think that's a, it's a bunch of hokey pokey. <laughs> they think that uh, it was all staged in, I think, Nevada or somewhere in the American, uh, in the American desert. The, the, the 1969 moonwalk. I talked was it last week I was talking about this. <laughs> uh, that uh, when Neil Armstrong and those guys stepped foot on the moon. No, but I don't believe that really happened. It was all staged. Well, you know, I, I think the evidence is pretty good that the Holocaust actually happened. I think the evidence is pretty good that Neil Armstrong and others actually have walked on the moon. Uh, so w when you, you, you kind of sift the evidence and weigh it and think about it, yeah, pretty good reason to believe that those things happened. But you have to sort these things out, because it's coming at you all the time. Should you believe it? Should you not? Uh, and it's okay to doubt. Central to what Christians believe is something which is outlandishly difficult to believe. You ever 
pause to think of this. Central to what we, we Christians, or purportedly and presumably we Christians believe, is something which is totally outlandish in, uh, that we're, we're asked to believe. <laughs> and, and not just one thing, but a, but a whole bunch of things. So for instance, uh, central to our faith is that God became a human being, the virgin birth. You know, how often do you hear a virgin birth? <laughs> a lot of people don't buy into that. Walked this earth, did all kinds of miracles, walked on top of the water, um, raised people from the dead, uh, gave sight to the blind. Okay. Then uh, the, the crucifixion, the suffering is not so hard to believe. They were just simply human things that happened, and that they happened commonly in, in that part of the world in that day and age. But then he came back to life on the third day. We're supposed to believe. Really. <clears throat> now, that people doubt that this happened should not surprise us. Right? What surprises me, actually, is, is how many people actually do believe it, or at least claim to believe it. And it, it does surprise me, because I often find people who are not particularly what you would say, they're, they're, you would maybe not think they were Christians. They're probably not church goers. Uh, but they quite readily believe things like this. Um, I, I often do funerals for people who are not particularly church goers, and I will tell them before the service, well, here, here's what, the kind of thing I'm going to say, <laughs> that you know, Jesus, came, Jesus died for our sins, he rose from the dead, and therefore we have hope of eternal life, because of what Jesus rises from the dead. And they say, okay, that's cool. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm going to get away with it, <laughs> which is kind of how I feel sometimes. But, you know, a lot of people believe it, or they say to you. So either, one, there are a lot more closet Christians than you and I know about, or two, there are a lot more closet doubters who, who seem to believe but don't actually or kind of have a lot of questions. And I think both are true. I think there are a lot of closet Christians around, and I think there are a lot of closet doubters around, and they may be here today. And that's okay. Thomas, see, the, the, the story was about that, uh, that John read earlier. Uh, Thomas was an honest doubter. We look at this guy, he's one of Jesus' inside guys, like the inside 11, if you will. Uh, and <laughs> um, the, the, the story begins on the evening of the day of resurrection. So this is on the Sunday evening. The resurrection happened on Sunday morning. In the evening, the, the guys are all gathered together. It says behind, and this is John writing. John was one of them. John was there. He says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews... So here's their state of mind post, post crucifixion of Christ. They're scrambled. They're bewildered. They're upset. They're, they, they're confused. They're, they're scared. I mean, they're probably, I don't know how far it is from where Galilee, uh, you know, probably a hundred mile walk or something like that. Uh, most of them were from there. They're kind of stuck in Jerusalem right now. They're just not sure what to do with themselves. Uh, they're afraid of the authorities. Their leader, who they thought was going to you know, bring in the kingdom of God, before their eyes, and they were going to be a big part of this uh, wonderful, uh, you know, the Messiah uh, thing. He's gone, and they're just, they're petrified. They're scared. They block the door. And Jesus comes and appears in the room with them. He says, hey, <laughs> peace be with you. <laughs> you, can, you can see why he would say that. And it's kind of like, hey, whoa, calm down. It's okay. <laughs> peace be with you. Shalom. And uh, he says it twice. And then he says it again the next week. So, and then it says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm going to send you. So there's a whole, you know, 180 degree swerve change starting to happen in their minds. Because they're seeing him alive. And they knew he was dead. Now the thing was, Thomas was not there that night. And so when they tell him about it, he says, you know what, I don't buy that. <laughs> you guys are full of all Unless I see for myself, unless I put my hands in the nail prints and thrust my hand in his side, remember the story, uh, it's in the, actually in the Gospel of John where the, uh, the, the Roman soldier uh, pierces his side with a spear, and there comes blood and water. There's evidence that he had, he had actually died. He says, I put my hand in his side, and I'm not going to believe. So then it says, a week later, which is roughly, you know, if, if Easter was, was last Sunday, a week later is this Sunday. So that's why we kind of traditionally often read this scripture on the second Sunday in Easter, because it's roughly that time frame. So this one week later, so about since last Sunday, 
the disciples are in the house, the house again, the same place where they were staying. Thomas is with them. The doors are locked again. <laughs> so, so this was not something that they just said, oh yes, we get it. They're still scared. The doors are still locked. Jesus says, peace be with you. And then he immediately focuses on Thomas and says, okay, Thomas, he says, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop it and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. That's, that's Thomas's conclusion. I mean, he has come great full, full, full around on this. Um, and, and that's kind of the point. This is almost the punchline or the climactic statement of, uh, of the Gospel of John. Gospel, if you go down to the end of this uh, uh, chapter, John des describes to us why he's doing, why he's written what he's written. He says, these are written. He says, Jesus had many other miraculous signs, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So his goal was to get people to believe in Christ, uh, believe that he is the Son of God, and by believing, by putting their trust in him, they would find life in his name. And so, uh, just before that, we have Thomas coming to the conclusion, my Lord and my God. He, he, uh, so John has led us through his book to bring us to, to that conclusion. So we might say that along with Thomas, my Lord and my God. So, so the point was that, you know, Thomas got his evidence. He asked for it. And Jesus did not say no, there's no way. He said, you know, I'm not, yeah, no. He got exactly what he asked for in this case. Because he was an honest devil. He was an honest editor. And they're, they're different. Uh, some people would, are just editors because they just don't want to, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll find any reason they can to, to, you know, to avoid God <laughs> and avoid the reality of, of, of God's say in our lives, uh, of, of God's judgment for us all, those kinds of things. You know, they'll try to, anything they can do to, to kind of wiggle off the hook. That's not honest editor. Honest editor says, really? Well, show me some evidence. How can I know this for myself? But, and Thomas was so sure that the tradition has it that uh, after, you know, not long after these days, uh, the disciples were dispersed and they went to all kinds of parts of the ancient world. Thomas, uh, tradition tells us, went to India. He was the, uh, the apostle to India. And there's actually a fair bit of uh, corroboration and traditions in that area and uh, in the Middle East that say probably true, that Thomas actually took the gospel to India and planted some churches there and eventually was killed there, which was the common experience of these guys, these witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, the tradition says that uh, of those, uh, those 11, well, we could say 12, if we include Math Matthias or Matthias, um, uh, except for John the Apostle, 11 of them were martyred for, for the testimony to Jesus and to the resurrection. They died. You know, and they, they, they suffered, they, were, they lived in deprivation, they, they, they left home, they wandered around, they had all kinds of troubles, they got persecuted, some of them got imprisoned and all that kind of stuff, and, and then they got killed. I'm going to give you some pause for thought. Would they do that for something they knew was not true? Or something that was just a, kind of a myth that somebody made up? Hmm. So, so, anyway, Thomas, that's how convinced he was. He went and spent his life, at, you know, on behalf of the gospel. And the evidence is still there for us today. And you might need it. You might need to think about it. Just even the accounts of these New Testament writers. So we have in the New Testament uh, quite a few uh, perspectives from the apostles, the early apostles, on the, who had seen the risen Jesus. So we find the writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and Paul. They talk about St. Peter. And they all talk about this and, and you know, say, we, we saw these things. Um, and the New Testament documents are the most scrutinized, most picked apart documents ever probably to be on the planet Earth. <laughs> People have been cr critically peeling through the pages and sifting through these books for, for you know, almost 2,000 years. And, and it's been subjected to every kind of scrutiny known that they've got literary criticism and historical criticism and textual criticism and source criticism and you know people try to, to, to define what, what this is all about and you know what it holds up under all that scrutiny it holds up it rings true even these these accounts of, of, of the risen christ 
You know what's, what to me rings true about them? One of the things that rings true is it's just how matter of fact they are. <laughs> how un un unembellished they are. And Jesus showed up in a room and he said, peace be with you. <laughs> and then later on, he, he, he ate some fish with them. It's, it's, it's so matter of fact. It's not like, and Jesus was in the midst of, you know, you know how they would do it if you were like a, an evangelist from the south of the states? <laughs> and this great light shone around. No! <laughs> None of that is there. It's all really quiet. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's just so matter of fact. Which to me lends to its credibility. So it's like, yeah, that's, that's what happened. We, went and we, we ran into Jesus. <laughs> and, and, you know, the strongest evidence in a court of law is eyewitness testimony. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing that, that clinches uh, a verdict better than you have several eyewitnesses. And, well, I was there, you know, I saw the guy, whatever, pull the trigger. You know, I watched it all happen. This is what happened. The jury's going to say, well, that, that pretty much tells the story. Eyewitness accounts are powerful. And we have it a plenty on the resurrection. I don't like it. It isn't the kind of thing you can prove by, uh, you know, scientific doing some experiments or something. Because it's a historical event. And all historical events that we know about, it's only how much attestation we have in records and eyewitness accounts and that sort of thing. And that's what we have a plenty for the resurrection of Christ. We have in here, and, and you know, the, the account of the eyewitnesses, the people that saw the risen Jesus Christ. Starting with the apostles, and then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, which we read from last week, is then later on, me too, he said. And he says, at one time, he showed himself to 500 of the brothers, all at the same time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. So it's a few years down the line, and, you know, 500 all at one time. <laughs> is that mass, what's that? Mass hallucination? Don't think so. And besides that, he says, there's like 400 of them. You can go you can go back and check it out and talk to them. And they were there. It's quite corroboratable. Another new word. <laughs> and uh, so, so we have these eyewitnesses. And in fact, that was their thing. In the early church, the, the book of Acts is full of this, this kind of thing. And we read this other scripture at the other churches, but uh, the apostles, like this is Acts chapter 5. The apostles have been arrested, and then an angel has left them out. And I'm like, do you believe that? And uh, so they go back into the temple and they start preaching again. And then the, the, the powers that be, the Sanhedrin, or the Council of the Jews, bring them back in. And they kind of try to get them to, to quiet down and stop preaching. And uh, Peter says, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. And then down to verse 32, we are witnesses of these things. And that was their common claim throughout the, the early church. We are the witnesses of these things. We saw it happen. We're not telling you a fairy tale here. <laughs> pretty amazing, pretty sad. So evidence is out there. For, for you. Um, and it's okay today. As long as you're willing to seriously look at the evidence. I mean, I think there's a kind of good, honest doubting, which, which is, is perfectly legit, and even probably necessary. Uh, a couple of serious, honest doubters that we, I've talked about before, but are, are Lee, one is Lee Strobel, who is a hard-nosed uh, journalist for the Chicago Tribune, you know, who was known for his, you know, he, he, he could get to the, the heart of the matter with the story. And he decided to, to, to disprove it, <laughs> to investigate the resurrection and the reality of Christ. Uh, we, we have, I have several copies of his book where we had a, we had a case of him a few years ago, uh, the, case, the Case for Christ. And he, he became convinced that the thing happened and became a Christian. Uh, a guy named Frank Morrison wrote a book, uh, Who Moved the Stone? He was a trial lawyer. And he was used to sifting through evidence and see what you know what rings true, what's what makes sense, what you know uh, those kinds of things. So he he had, he had waited, I think, until he retired or, or he had the opportunity in his life. He was always wanting to write a book disproving the resurrection, <laughs> disproving the Christian faith. So he finally got around to it and he started going through all this evidence and he became a Christian. He became so convinced that you know the, the evidence led him to believe that the resurrection actually did happen. Trial. But I think doubting 
is a real part of faith. Or it's a part of real faith. It, and not just doubting the resurrection. Uh, you might doubt the resurrection. You might doubt things like whether God is good. You doubt the goodness of God. Or you might doubt the love of God. How can you love me when all the kinds of things that have happened to me or others go on? Or you might doubt the justice of God. Or the purpose of God for the world or for yourself. Do you, you get that God's got a big plan for the whole world? And he's got a plan for you individually? Yeah? Believe that? Because it's pretty clear scripture is, is telling us that that's the case. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the kinds of doubts about those things, scripture is full. It's almost ironic. It doesn't, it doesn't shy away from that. So how we know it's kind of okay? It's full of this. It's full of lamentations, for instance. Like things like uh, the psalmist back in Psalm 22, which Jesus quotes on the cross. Uh, Jesus quotes from the psalm when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Could be construed as dead. <laughs> Had God really forsaken him? No. Of course not. But he felt like he had. You go into the, the, well, there's a whole book called Lamentations, there's a whole book called Job, which you don't have a whole lot of time to go into, but uh, there's a whole book called Lamentations. And I don't know if, you, if you're looking through a Bible, Lamentations chapter 3, this is in the latter part of the, the Old Testament. Well, a couple of Lamentations comes right after Jeremiah, it's generally believed to have been written by Jeremiah. Here's what he writes. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again, all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. Wow, that was one of the prophets. <laughs> Sounds like he had a few doubts some days. <laughs> and he says it better than any of us ever could. Do we ever go to those lengths? He doesn't even listen to my prayers. He just gives me hardship. <laughs> and and uh, Job, well, Job, Job had everything taken from him. God allowed it. And, and his three, he, he, at the end, he's lost all his family, lost all his possessions. He sits in an ash heap and he scrapes his boils. He's lost his health. He scrapes his boils with a potsherd. And his three best friends come along to comfort him and tell him, you know, you need to repent. He says, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. He says, God, why? And God never actually tells him why. The, the crazy thing about the story of Job. But it's a whole book that's dedicated to this. The questions we have, the doubts that we have about God. And you know, at the end of the day, God just reveals himself to Job. And Job says, oh, I don't get it, but I get it. <laughs> wow. I just, you know, I never realized how wonderful, how big you are. And he restored Job. And it, 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 these questions are not easy questions. But it's, what I'm saying is that okay to do. In the New Testament, there's a story about a little, a, a father comes with a little boy to, for Jesus to heal him. And he's demon possessed. And he's in a horrible condition. And Jesus has this little conversation with him, and he says, you know what? All things are possible for those who believe. And the father says to Jesus, I believe. Please help my unbelief. Please help my unbelief. So, and does Jesus at that point say, no, not good enough? No. He heals the little boy. He honors the guy's honesty. He says, I believe. I kind of believe. Pardon me, doesn't believe. No, help my unbelief. That's okay. Thomas, same story. Thomas is not put in front of us and will say, that guy's a bad guy. He should have believed and he didn't. <laughs> no. That's not what it's about. it's about. It's about saying, you know what? It's okay to doubt and question and wrestle. Thomas did it. And he got his answer. And so can you. We may think we believe everything, but we probably don't. We harbor doubts, but we keep them to ourselves. That's what we're called. I call it Doubters Anonymous. We're hiding. You know, go ahead and doubt. 
you have my permission for what that's worth. <laughs> if anybody cares. The, the way to deeper faith is actually to face our doubts and honestly grapple with them before God. Honestly grapple with them before God. Prayer, prayerfully lay them out. You look, God, you know, I just don't get this. How can that be? This, 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 and you love me? Are you sure? No. He actually came back from the dead? These are the kinds of questions that we can, we can wrestle with before God. So this week, think about what you believe, or you think you believe, or, or you're purport to believe, or you think you're supposed to believe. Do you doubt, perhaps, the love of God? Do you doubt, perhaps, that you're destined for eternal life? Do you doubt that God has a purpose for you? Talk to him about it. It will make you stronger. Shall we pray?